Mars. Since the days of Apollo, the red planet has called to us. The next frontier, a place to explore, to make discoveries, to build a new home. The 2010s has seen extraordinary progress towards realising this vision. With a renewed push to send astronauts to deep space, the rise of reusable rocketry, and a wealth of new knowledge and discoveries, the colonisation of Mars is firmly embedded in the public consciousness. In today's Mars Mission Update, we're going to be taking a look at how far we've come to sending humans to Mars over the past decade. We'll cover the progress towards crewed Mars missions, how new technologies are changing the landscape, recent major scientific discoveries about the Red Planet, and finally, the rising prominence of Mars in society. Ten years ago, human spaceflight stood at a crossroads. The notion of human expeditions to Mars, envisioned for decades, fell almost entirely under the purview of national space agencies or an international mission. NASA had just released in 2009 its own detailed overview of a prospective human Mars mission, the Design Reference Architecture 5.0. There was clear agreement that Mars should be the long-term destination of human spaceflight. But it was a time of uncertainty, with the cancellation of NASA's Constellation Moon program in 2010 and the Space Shuttle retiring in 2011. The short-term future of human spaceflight was in question. Some advocated for a return to the Moon, missions to near-Earth asteroids, or even a direct mission to Mars. It was decided that NASA would focus on building a heavy lift rocket and deep space capsule, the Space Launch System, or SLS, and Orion while contracting out cargo and crew shuttle services to the International Space Station, to international partners, and US private companies. After a decade of work, and over $30 billion spent to date, the combined SLS Orion system, originally planned to launch in 2017, has yet to fly. Orion alone did launch once in 2014 on the commercial Delta IV Heavy rocket. Similarly, the commercial crew program, originally envisioned for first flights in 2015, has suffered multiple delays. As a consequence, it has been almost a decade since American astronauts last launched from the United States. At its heart, delays to both these programs can be traced to underfunding in the first half of the decade, with a low around 2013. Since then, NASA has received a slight year-on-year -year budget increase, which is encouraging, but note that in inflation-adjusted dollars, the NASA budget has been more or less stable, at 0.5% of the federal budget. But a decade of development and delays is now coming to an end. In 2020, the first commercial crew missions by SpaceX and Boeing are due to carry American astronauts to the space station. NASA is also preparing for Artemis 1, the first SLS and Orion launch in late 2020, or early 2021 as part of a revitalised drive to land a crew on the moon in 2024. Though the near-term attention of NASA is squarely focused on the moon, Mars has remained as the horizon goal for the mid to late 2030s. Traditional aerospace companies such as Lockheed Martin have been pitching designs for Mars mission architectures, especially those leveraging NASA's planned lunar gateway as a waypoint. But overall, there remains little detail at present as to how precisely NASA plans to send people to Mars. This being said, NASA has been conducting research and development on technologies which will prove vital for human expeditions to Mars. One important study was NASA's Year in Space mission, held from 2015 to 2016, where US astronaut Scott Kelly and Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko spent 342 days aboard the space station. Though there has been several space missions with durations longer than 300 days before, the participation of Scott's twin brother, Mark Kelly, on the ground offered a genetic control to clearly identify the effect of long-duration spaceflight on the human body. After Scott returned to Earth, his recovery was monitored, and after years of analysis, the first results from NASA's twin study were released in April 2019. The study found that while in space, the body undergoes several significant changes to factors such as body weight, bone density, muscle mass, gene regulation, and the thickness of the retina. But these factors return to normal six months after flight. There were, however, some long-term effects, 
including changes to gene expression, increased DNA damage, an overabundance of short telomeres, and reduced cognitive function, which persisted after six months. Given that the journey to Mars could take up to nine months, these findings provide invaluable lessons in preparing the human body for future missions to deep space. Another notable development has been the continual work on a new generation of surface suits for use on the Moon and Mars. In October, NASA unveiled a prototype of the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU, which is envisioned to be ready in time for the Artemis III lunar landing in 2024. Compared to the suits of the Apollo era, or on the space station today, the XEMU is a modular suit offering flexible sizing, enhanced mobility, dust resistance, and improved CO2 scrubbing to offer up to eight hours of service activity at a time. Following Artemis III, NASA plans to transfer the production and improvement of these suits to commercial enterprises, which could include customising them for operations on the Martian surface. Though these government-driven advances are certainly helping to lay foundations for future Mars missions, they sometimes overshadow what has been the most remarkable success story of the past decade. Seemingly out of nowhere, in a few short years, a single launch provider, the private company SpaceX, has risen to dominate the commercial launch industry. The meteoric rise of SpaceX, a company with the express goal of enabling the colonisation of Mars, has upended many long-held paradigms at the heart of the space industry. Chief among them is the development of the first orbital-class reusable rocket, the Falcon 9, which has flown 77 times since it debuted in 2010. SpaceX are now developing Starship, a next-generation launch system capable of landing up to 100 people on any surface in the solar system, with an ambitious target to land the first people on Mars in 2024. So how did they accomplish so much in such a short period of time? Here's a quick overview of their most notable achievements to date. In June 2010, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket entered service, offering a modest 10-ton launch payload to low Earth orbit. This was followed in December of that year by the demonstration flight of a cargo vessel, the Dragon, designed to provide resupply services for the International Space Station under contract with NASA. Two years later, in May 2012, the Falcon 9 launched Dragon to the space station, becoming the first commercial spacecraft to successfully attach to the space station. This began a series of commercial resupply missions, with 19 conducted to date. 2010 also saw the beginning of the Grasshopper program, a series of experiments designed to test key technologies required to re-land a rocket's first stage after launch. The lessons learned from Grasshopper were soon rolled out into new versions of the Falcon 9, which attempted a series of ocean landings of the first stage booster in 2014 and 2015, which proved to be an extraordinarily difficult challenge. Nevertheless, in December 2015, SpaceX achieved the first successful landing of an orbital-class rocket, a feat still unmatched by any nation or company four years later. This was followed in April 2016 by the first successful landing of a rocket on a drone ship at sea. Less than a year later, in March 2017, SpaceX relaunched a Falcon 9 with a previously flown first stage, proving the principle of reusable orbital rocketry for the first time, heralding a new era of substantial reductions in launch costs. SpaceX have now made reusable rocketry routine, with 47 first stage boosters recovered to date, an 85% success rating, with a record 11-day booster reuse turnaround. Building on the successes of the Falcon 9, SpaceX has developed a more powerful super-heavy launch vehicle, the Falcon Heavy, which saw its debut flight in February 2018. The Falcon Heavy remains the most powerful rocket in the world today, capable of lifting up to 64 tonnes to low Earth orbit, while remaining one of the cheapest launch vehicles available today due to its partial reusability. Parallel to the innovation in reusable rocketry, SpaceX has also been working towards launching astronauts. In 2014, they unveiled the Dragon 2, or Crew Dragon, as part of NASA's commercial crew program to ferry astronauts to the International Space Station. After years of development, Dragon 2 finally launched on an uncrewed demonstration mission to the space station in March 2019. It is now expected to launch its first crewed mission in early 2020.
But perhaps the most important development of the past decade was the unveiling of SpaceX's Starship launch system in 2016. The design of Starship has changed rapidly over the last three years, as reviewed in previous Mars mission updates, with this year seeing construction and testing of the first prototypes. A scaled-down version of Starship, called Starhopper, began construction in late 2018, ultimately leading to a 150 meter hop test in August, pioneering Starship in the same way that Grasshopper pioneered reusability for the Falcon 9. SpaceX have now moved to constructing and testing full-scale Starship prototypes, though the testing hasn't always gone exactly according to plan. This is an important part though of SpaceX's design philosophy. They test systems to the limit, encountering failures along the way, but then they redesign, they try again, and they rapidly innovate in a way which is unique in the space industry. It was this very iterative philosophy that enabled them to perfect reusable rocketry, and has catapulted them into their current position of dominance in the commercial launch market. Most recently, SpaceX has recognised that the first two full-scale Starship prototypes, known as Mark I and Mark II, did not meet the necessary requirements to be flight-worthy. Using the lessons learned from constructing these prototypes, they have now started building the first flight design of Starship, previously called Mark III, which is currently targeting a 20km launch around March of 2020. With a clear vision, world-leading engineering expertise, and a game-changing spacecraft under development, SpaceX are well-placed to become the first private company to land on Mars in the 2020s. The past decade has also seen numerous advances in the scientific study and knowledge of the Red Planet. At the start of the 2010s, the study of Mars was mainly conducted by orbital remote sensing, with preliminary scientific surface studies being undertaken by the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. As the 2010s progressed, we have witnessed a new era of surface-based analytical measurements, in-situ analysis of the Martian upper atmosphere, and the first studies of Mars's interior. Though the Spirit and Opportunity missions ended in March 2010 and February 2019 respectively, five new missions have successfully reached the Martian system in the last 10 years. Curiosity, MAVEN, the Mars Orbiter mission, the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, and InSight. They joined the aging Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Express, and Mars Odyssey satellites which arrived in the 2000s. In August 2012, NASA's Curiosity rover landed in Gale Crater on Mars. It was the first mobile analytical laboratory on another planet, designed to assess the past habitability of Mars by studying sedimentary rock deposits. Curiosity has found evidence that Gale Crater once contained an ancient lake of liquid water over three billion years ago, which maintained habitable conditions for millions of years. It has confirmed orbital detections of hydrated minerals, and in June 2018 discovered 3.5 billion year old organic compounds. While these organics could be remnants of ancient Martian life, they could also have been produced by abiotic chemical reactions, or delivered to Mars by comets. But what this does indicate is that early Mars had abundant liquid water containing the ingredients for life to flourish. Another key discovery by Curiosity is that the level of methane, a trace gas in Mars's atmosphere, appears to show seasonal variability. Martian methane has been a subject of intense interest since it was inferred from Earth-based telescopes in the 90s and from Mars orbit in 2004, as it could be a signature of subsurface biological activity. Though the background level seen by Curiosity is very low, less than one molecule per billion in the atmosphere, Curiosity has also noticed sudden spikes in the methane concentration by over a factor of 10. It remains unclear what is causing the seasonal variation and spikes, with chemical, geothermal, or biological explanations being considered. Curiosity was followed to Mars in September 2014 by two orbiters, MAVEN and the Mars Orbiter mission. NASA's MAVEN spacecraft 
was tasked with determining the past and present rate of Martian atmospheric escape in order to understand how Mars changed from its past habitable state to what we see today. Maven has shown that the original Martian atmosphere was 10 to 100 times thicker than today, with the transition from the warm habitable state occurring 4.2 to 3.7 billion years ago. The atmosphere was largely stripped away by the solar wind once Mars lost its ancient global magnetic field, with 70% of Mars's original water lost into space. Maven's low orbit has also allowed it to sample the upper Martian atmosphere, building a global wind map of currents 200 kilometers above the surface, a key insight into the Martian climate system. Also in 2014, India's Mars Orbiter mission, or Mangalayan, became the first Asian spacecraft to successfully reach Mars. While mainly a technology demonstration mission, its wide orbit has enabled it to take some truly spectacular, true colour images of full Martian hemispheres, providing a realistic perspective for what you would see with your own eyes in orbit around Mars. Though only designed for six months, Mangalayan is still going strong five years later and is due to be followed up with a successor mission in 2024. With mounting evidence of an ancient, warm, wet Mars, the second half of the 2010s has seen numerous studies revealing an abundance of accessible water ice on Mars today. Though subsurface ice has been seen on Mars before, it is only recently that the quantity and distribution of this ice has been revealed. In 2016, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter inferred buried ice sheets in the Martian mid-latitudes, and in 2018, it observed exposed ice layers in cliffs, which can extend to up to 100 metres in thickness. All in all, it appears that one third of the Martian surface contains shallow water ice. Also in 2018, Mars Express found evidence of a 20 kilometre wide lake of liquid water 1.5 kilometres beneath the southern polar ice cap. The latest research from December 2019 using Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Mars Odyssey data shows bands of buried water ice around the polar regions within 2.3 centimetres to 0.8 metres of the surface. Taking all these findings together, the most widespread shallow ice deposits are located in Arcadia Planitia, within 30 centimetres of the surface, the very region where SpaceX is currently considering for the first Starship landings on Mars. This discovery of abundant water ice will ultimately prove a critical resource for the long-term exploration and settlement of Mars. Alongside these discoveries, the arrival of ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, a joint European-Russian mission, in 2016 has deepened one of Mars's greatest mysteries. The ExoMars Orbiter was designed to measure the quantity of methane and other trace gases in the Martian atmosphere, helping to resolve the question of whether such gases could be signatures of active biological or geological processes. However, the first result, published in April 2019, reported no methane anywhere in the Martian atmosphere. This has led to intense debate, especially given that Curiosity detected a large methane spike in June 2019. Reconciling these observations requires a mechanism which destroys methane near the Martian surface before it can spread higher into the atmosphere. The ExoMars Orbiter is now conducting simultaneous measurements of Gale Crater along with Mars Express in an attempt to resolve this enigma. Finally, the most recent mission to Mars is NASA's InSight lander, which touched down in November 2018. This is the first dedicated mission to study the interior of Mars, using a seismometer and heat probe. Previous orbital measurements of the Martian gravitational field have been used in 2016 to produce a map of the crustal thickness of Mars, but InSight is the first to extensively map out the interior of the Red Planet. Though the first results are still pending peer review in scientific journals, some of the early findings are fascinating. InSight has detected over 300 Mars quakes to date, with two magnitude 3 events traced to what could be the first active Martian seismic zone. It is not known yet what could have caused these events, but some possibilities are planetary contraction due to internal cooling, 
or subsurface magma moving about. InSight's magnetometer has also measured that the Martian crust has a magnetic field strength some 20 times stronger than previously predicted, indicating a quite prominent ancient magnetic field. The magnetometer has also inferred that there is an electrically conducting layer within 100 kilometers of the surface. This layer could be the first sign of a global liquid water reservoir beneath the Martian surface. Taken together, the discoveries of the past decade have cemented that Mars was once hospitable, with the right chemistry, environment, and liquid water medium to support life. We now also know that the Mars of today is far more dynamic than previously thought, with evidence of subsurface water and variability in trace gas emissions, which could be indications of active geology or subsurface biology on the planet today. Though we have come far, the next decade promises to answer many outstanding questions about the planet. 2020 alone is a Mars launch window year, with a record four missions due to fly. NASA's Mars 2020 rover, Europe's Rosalind Franklin rover, China's Huaxing-1 orbiter and rover, and the United Arab Emirates Mars Hope orbiter. I'll be sure to cover all these missions and their scientific discoveries in future Mars mission updates. For the final part of this update, I want to take a quick look at the changing perception of human Mars missions in wider society. Because public interest in Mars missions is essential, whether governmental or private in nature. For missions by space agencies, this link is relatively obvious, as increased public interest can translate directly into support for further spending of taxpayer money on scientific missions and on human spaceflight. But this is also important for private sector enterprises like SpaceX, as wider interest helps them to attract investment to fund research and development activities. The 2010s was a decade where the concept of Mars colonization reignited in the public imagination in a way we haven't seen since the early years of the space age. Early in the decade, the public image of Mars missions was dominated by space agencies, in particular NASA. Worldwide excitement for the 2012 Curiosity landing was a particular high, with NASA harnessing social media to share photos, videos and live streams very successfully around the world. However, big events like this were faced against the backdrop of somewhat declined interest in human spaceflight following the retirement of the Space Shuttle in 2011, as historically the image of NASA has been intertwined with human spaceflight. But something changed around the middle of the decade. In particular, when a Dutch organisation called Mars One announced its intention to conduct a notional one-way mission to Mars, media platforms the world over were set ablaze. Mars One opened up a global astronaut selection process in 2013, with the organisation reaching its peak in 2015 with the announcement of a shortlist of 100 candidates. The media and public interest surrounding Mars One, especially the one-way trip aspect, was perhaps a reflection of intense interest surrounding the question of long-term survival in an alien environment. Though in the end Mars One was ultimately unable to put together the finances to complete its selection process, with the commercial arm of the company going into administration in early 2019, there are some important lessons to be learned from the legacy of Mars One. Foremost, it shows that interest in human Mars missions is a truly global phenomenon, and is not just constrained to the traditional space powers. It also demonstrates that there is a broad pool of people from backgrounds all over the world who are willing to go on missions to the Red Planet. In the second half of the 2010s, the rise of SpaceX has dominated the public conversation surrounding human Mars missions. This perhaps began in earnest with the announcement of the Red Dragon mission in April 2016, a proposal to send a Dragon capsule to attempt the first landing on Mars by a private company. Though Red Dragon was ultimately cancelled, it was replaced by an even more ambitious proposal in SpaceX's Starship, which has only grown in public prominence since it was first announced by Elon Musk in 2016. But perhaps the event with the biggest reach was the launch of a Tesla into space 
on the first Falcon Heavy launch, which instantly became a global sensation, filling front pages all over the world. With NASA now largely focused on the moon, at least in the near term, SpaceX is rapidly shaping the public image of what a human Mars mission might look like. One needs only look at the sheer amount of books, films and games featuring Mars released over the last 10 years to see that public interest in the Red Planet is at an all-time high, and I for one can't wait to see what the next decade brings. Well, that brings us to the end of this Mars mission update, the last of 2019 and the decade. I'm curious to know what you think was the most important event of the last decade in spaceflight. Please do drop your thoughts in the comments down below, and we'll kick off a bit of a conversation down there. I was blown away by the response to my last video, especially everyone who expressed interest in joining a Discord channel to develop future Martian colonist videos. If you signed up to this, I haven't forgotten, I'll be in touch in late January once I'm back from a workshop on the James Webb Space Telescope. In other news, I'm pleased to say that I finally graduated from my PhD in October. If you're interested in exoplanets, and especially exoplanet atmospheres, my thesis is now publicly available online. I wrote the first chapter to be an accessible overview of the field of exoplanet science, with viewers just like yourself in mind, so by all means, please check it out. I've also been working on putting together a team here at Cornell to produce YouTube videos for the Carl Sagan Institute. These will cover planetary science, exoplanets, and the search for alien life, among many other topics, highlighting the exciting research being done here. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful new year, and I can't wait to share with you all the exciting developments 2020 has in store for us. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, so that you don't miss any of them. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in 2020 for the next Mars Mission Update. Thanks for watching everyone, please do let me know if you have any questions or comments down below. To make sure you don't miss future Mars Mission Updates and upcoming videos, hit subscribe and click the notification bell for all the latest news on our journey to the Red Planet.